Okay, let's learn to the Kabbalistic roots of Shavuot, everybody. Don't go anywhere. There's a bit of a connection problem on Instagram, so maybe come over to Facebook. And we have to complain about Instagram's connection, but um, you might want to, those on Insta, if you go to Facebook, Avi Hill, it's on my page. Okay, everybody, if you've got pens and paper, you might want to take some notes. This is some deep stuff, some deep stuff. This can change your life. This time next Sunday night, we have a huge night ahead of us. And let's start understanding what's really going on in Shavuot. Point number one says the Kudushas Levi, Levi Yitzhak of Please don't make the tragic mistake of thinking that on Sunday nights we're merely commemorating the giving of the Torah, the giving of the Ten Commandments. It's a nice commemoration. Cool event happened. 3,300 years ago, the Jewish people were given the Torah and we're here to commemorate. Mm -mm, that happened, but it's way much more than that. Explains the mystics. The time is not a motionless graph which merely reflects events. So, for example, I'm going to tell you something very important now. Okay, so don't, now you write this down. I'm going to tell you my birthday. And it's my 50th this year, so I expect a way bigger present, everybody. Right, so my 50th birthday, I know I don't look it, but um, c'est la vie. Even though I've got some white hairs now. But, um, I see, I'm hiding them. 10th of July. On the 10th of July, the 17th of Tammuz, I was born. So you could say that I was born on that day, and therefore my birthday was the date that I was born. So you're kind of like putting it in your diary. Oh, Rabbi Hill was born on the 10th of July. Mm -mm. It's the other way around. It's the 17th of Tammuz which caused me to be born on that day. Because that energy and that Zman, Hashem had decided for whatever in his, wisdom, in his infinite wisdom that that's when I needed to be born into this world. Because as you, if you go to YouTube and go to J Network 613 and go to my talk on the Kabbalah of the Zodiac, you'll see that how Hashem uses the Zodiac is to give you different gifts to help you assist to achieve your potential. So obviously for me too, the gifts that I needed in my life, I need to be born on the 10th of July. So Zman isn't an effect, it's actually the cause. Time, the mystics explain, is somewhat like a spiral. But even though someone who's depressed, they feel they're going like this merry-go-round, it's Sunday, it's Monday, it's now Wednesday night again. Rabbi Hill's like going on again, Wednesday night. Okay. But that's not, that's a joke by the way, right? That's not the way it works. In, in mysticism we explain that this is a Wednesday night, which is Rosh Chodesh Sivan, instead in London it's Rosh Chodesh, it's Rosh Chodesh Sivan, Tov Shim Pei Aleph, we're hitting a place in the spiral, everything's a spiral, we're coming now to this place in the spiral, where the Jewish people have never been here before, none of us have ever been here before, this is unique, there's a unique moment in time, to achieve something that's never been achieved before, so this Sunday night, there's going to be an energy on Shavuot, an energy where God's going to say, do you want the Torah? And the way you respond is going to be pivotal to your destiny, to your future. And if you don't respond in the right way, you've missed that opportunity and you can never get it back. Because even the next year, that will be Tovshin Pei Base, that will be 5782. That's going to be a whole different energy, a whole different gift, a whole different opportunity. But this year's gift, you'll have missed. So I'm really, really happy you're with me right now. And don't go anywhere because you need to be here for the next 60 minutes to know how to achieve your gift and receive your gift and use your gift and essentially get it from Hashem. So that's the first thing. It's a celebration, not a commemoration. That's why the blessing we make is Shechianu v'kimanu v'giyanu l'azman azeh. We don't say l'azman ahu. We don't say that there's a, at that time, wow Hashem, thank you so much for over 3,000 years ago giving us the Torah. Mm -mm. What we say is, we say Hashem, Thank you so much for giving me the Torah tonight. Hasman Azer, we're going to make that blessing at the beginning of Shavuot. There'll be uniqueness on Sunday night, which will never be repeated, has never been, will never, never be again. And it's up to us if we want to learn how to maximize that energy and that gift that's coming to a world near you, please God, this Sunday night. That's kind of a bit of an intro. So now I have a question for you, and I'd like an answer if that's okay with you. You have to give me an answer. Why do you think it is that on first night Pesach, it doesn't really matter your background Jewishly, whether you're Orthodox, whatever denomination you are, traditional, secular, 
You still manage normally to get into a Seder night. Kind of Seder night runs after you. There's some family member saying, come to Seder. There's some Chabad house saying, come to Seder. There's some rabbi saying, come to Seder. There's some friend coming, come to Seder. And normally for the majority of world jury, they'll actually sit and experience in a Seder, which is quite amazing considering how assimilated and secular, unfortunately, so many of us are. But yet Pesach night, the majority are doing it. Yom Kippur, same thing. Yom Kippur, irrespective of your denomination, irrespective of your background, there's something in the air. You know, I've had the pleasure of being in Tel Aviv, not probably the most, um, you know, ultra-Orthodox city in the world, let's just say. But yet Yom Kippur, nothing, the streets, you can walk in the middle of the streets, you're feeling the, the, the holiness and the, and the peace, which actually, by the way, I feel every time I'm walking around in Tel Aviv, because it's so holy. The Kaddish is palpable. But you have to maybe have your eyes closed to feel that holiness. On Yom Kippur, you can have your eyes open and see that holiness. It's amazing. So that's Yom Kippur. But yet, tragically, on Shavuot, the day, which in a sense should be the most important day of our Jewish festivals, because that's the day we got the Torah. That's the day we married Hashem. That's the day we became Jewish. That's the day where all other mitzvahs only come from the origin of that day. Prior to Shavuot, we didn't have, we weren't halachically Jewish. We couldn't make up a minyan. There was no laws yet. There was no declaration. There was no signing. We hadn't signed nada yet. Pesach, in a sense, the mitzvah of eating matzah only comes from Shavuot. The mitzvah of Yom Kippur only comes from Shavuot. So why is it that let's say Yom Kippur and Pesach, so many people do. But Shavuot, I call it Shavuot. People have no idea it even exists. And there's this like, you know, English translation, I'm not going to try and pronounce, beginning with a P, forget about it. Someone can type it in if they think they know how to spell it. So why do you think that is? I'd like some messages now on Instagram and on Facebook, uh, on YouTube, possibly, right? Why do you think that is? Why do you think that is that we don't know what shovel what is? Why did the world jury not know about Shavuos? It's Shavuot. It's like, what is that? What is Shavuos? What is it? Like, really? Like I was learning with one of my students this week and, and you know, he's someone who's really quite learned and had, didn't know to even think of taking off work. That's one of the days you're meant to take off work. When you're on the spiritual level, you're ready to take off for Chag. Which, by the way, on, on good news, we read kind of Boris Johnson, because Boris Johnson's now in the UK. At any rate, he now allows hugs. So we can literally be now, wait for this, a hug samech. We can really, we can have a happy hug, this, this, this Shavuot. We can even legally give hugs. So it's a hug, it's a hug, and, and you're meant to take off work. And, and that's a day like Shabbat, where we're keeping the mitzvah of Shabbat. There's a difference between festivals and, do you like that, Sherry? There's a difference between festivals and Shabbat is on Shabbat. Is, is all the 39 melachas we connect to and, and Shavuot and Yom Tov, you're allowed to cook from an existing flame and you're allowed to carry things essential for Shavuot. So we're saying from Florence, the other Chagim are a gift on Shavuot, very good. But what does that mean? What does that mean? The other are a gift on Shavuot. And why is that? Why is it? You can, by the way, come again, Florence, you're awesome. Right? So what does that mean? The why can you... Florence is saying that the other Chagim are a gift, but Shavuot, we have to earn it. Why is that? What does that mean? Any, any explanations? Anyone like to um, attempt a stab at an answer? Here we go. Someone, nice to see you, Yael. Stay with us. The awesome holy Yael's in the house. So that's the question. Why is what's so hidden about Shavuot? Any other answers coming in? So in Kabbalah, the Arizal explains the following. On Seder night, you're sitting there and you say Shekhi Yonaviki 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 And actually, even in beforehand in Aravit, in Mariv, Hashem is going to download to you a free download called Higher Consciousness, which is called Godless Tzemoichin, Godless Rishon, Katnus Rishon, Godless Sheini, Katnus Sheini. We're going to get a tremendous Godless. We're going to get a higher level of consciousness on, on, on Pesach. That's a free gift. Aries is the initial inspiration. In Kabbalah, we connect it to Chokhmah. 
Chachmer is that free flash of inspiration that comes in. When you get that flash of inspiration, it's got nothing to do with you, actually. Nothing to do with you. Then the next month is Iyar, is Taurus. That was the sphere. This is all the work we've had to do. We're climbing up, climbing up. There's been tragedies like crazy. As you can see, the sphere is very... It's a time of tremendous dinim, tremendous judgments. That's why my beard's a bit longer than normal, because the mystics say you're meant to grow it all the way to, to kind of protect us. So mercy, I'm trying... My, my white hair should be protecting all, all, all of you guys, wherever you are in the world, especially Ariel there in, 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 in Ashkelon and Carla there in Tel Aviv, whoever else, Emma's there in Tel Aviv, Hashem, and all of you. You know, the, 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 should, the, the beard should be a rachamim for all of you. But Shavuot is a energy which is called Das, which is the fusion in, in, in the Zodiac, it's the Tomim, it's the twins. It's now our partnership with Hashem. We only get the higher consciousness again in Shabbat night if you want it, if you've earned it, if you've worked towards it. It's called in Kabbalah, it's Rosh Hashanah Eilon and it's Rosh Hashanah Tata. It's Rosh Hashanah means awakening from above. Sometimes that inspiration, like those moments, sometimes when you've fallen in love, anyone got those moments, anyone fell in love, where it came from nowhere, and it was just like, wow, this beautiful, amazing feeling that you've done nothing to deserve and you've got this huge pangs of love, that's the first phase. Shavuos is the second phase. Shavuos is that phase which I saw beautifully with my parents, where by the end of their married life, it was so beautiful to watch them totally harmonious, totally feeling one. It was gorgeous to see the, 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 the oneness in their relationship. They became like, like a one, but they needed 50 years of tremendous work to achieve that. So Shavuos is you can have the gift, but only if you're going to work for it, only if you have worked for it. It's amazing how much conversion and Shavuos comes. Many of my students, when, when they started converting, the real initial inspiration came of a Shavuot. Always someone comes into the room, someone comes into the Zoom, someone comes into the synagogue on Shavuot where their initial inspiration really begins. It's amazing because conversion is very connected to Shavuot. That's why Ruth, the book Ruth, which is the book of the first female convert, is the one we read on Shavuot because it really all her dedication and her conversion really explains and, and denotes the levels of self-sacrifice that we're all meant to go for to have that relationship with Hashem. We're all really converted. We all converted at Har Sinai. And really Hashem wants us to kind of really go through the conversion process every year and especially during the Sfira. What are we prepared to do for Hashem? What are we prepared to do for each other? What are we prepared to do for ourselves? How are we going to spiritually grow? And that's why most people don't know about Shavuot because unfortunately you can only get it if you've earned it. And most people don't even know there's a game to play to earn. It's not even their fault, most people. That we call Tinek Shanishba. They, they don't even know the beauty in Jewish spirituality, unfortunately. But those of you lucky ones who, who have access to the honey and the beauty and the deliciousness, I hope you have been working on your spirituality over this sphere at home. And even if you haven't, it's good news for you because even between now and Shavuot, you can prepare yourself, you can ready yourself. So that moment the Shavuot night comes in and the download comes in, you can receive it because this is a download that you need to buy. You know, sometimes on your phone, you've got free downloads and sometimes you've got downloads you've got to purchase. Shavuot is a purchase one. You've actually got to pay. Obviously, you don't pay the money on Shavuot itself, but prior to Shavuot, you've got to earn it. You've got to earn that download. You've got to earn the, for you to get the Ten Commandments. And that is the key reason why most people don't know it exists. More than that, as we spoke many times, the letters of Hashem's name appear on every month. So when Hashem sends his Shefa, he sends his energy through every month, he sends it through the letters of his name. And the Yud and the He and the Vav and the He change formation 12 times over the 12 months of the year. This month, the month today is Rosh Chodesh Sivan, it's Yud and a Vav, and then a He and a He. And that means mystically of the following. Yud and, and, and the Vav is masculine. The two He's is, is the feminine, which means it's that true fusion and partnership of the feminine and the masculine, which means it's, it's real about unity. If any of you are Geminis, any of you Geminis, message me in. If you're a Gemini, any Geminis, they're really fantastic at friendships. They love friendships. The twins, which embodies the Ta'omim of Geminis, is denoting actually Moshe and Aaron. It's denoting unity and friendship. And this is really the month which is all about friendship, which is one of the reasons why the prerequisite 
for us receiving the Torah at Har Sinai, which is one of our jobs we've got to do now. So it says in the Torah famously, Vayichan Yisrael Negedahar, and he, the three million people, are called he. It called he. We all became one because finally we got to that moment, Ki'ish Echad, Belev Echad, one man, one heart. And maybe that's at least one good thing that's coming out of this situation in Israel right now that we're feeling all so super connected to each other and full of love for each other. We're getting, please God, closer to the Ish Echad, Belev Echad. So please God, when it comes to Sunday night, we're going to be ready to receive the Torah. So with that said as my intro, let's now dive in to four questions, if that's all right. Let's teach you the Kabbalistic roots of Shavuot. The secret. The secret of Shavuot. Here we go. Starts off with a piece of Talmud in Bukharot, page eight. And explains that there was a conversation, a discussion, a debate between the elders of Athens and Rav Yoshua. One of the sages. And it's amazing how these elders of Athens knew more about spirituality and Judaism than most of us know. And the elders of Athens came and said a riddle to Rabbi Yeshua, and the riddle was the following. It says, when you want to propose to someone, the person you fall in love with and you love dearly is normally the first person you're going to go and propose to. And then if you go to someone else and they turn you down, by the end you're scraping the bottom of the barrel and then you're going to that last resort to propose that was their question to him and Rabbi Shu understood straight away you might not understand what he means Rabbi Shu understood what he means because what they meant was the following this is what happened the Midrash says God didn't first of all come to the Jewish people Mm -mm. you know that he didn't ask us first and foremost we want the Torah we're taught by our sages, first of all, Hashem went to the nation of Esau, which is the elders of Athens, the, Ro- the Rome, Romans, Rome, the Western world, the Edomites. And first of all, went to them, or according to some opinions, their angel, and said, do you want the Torah? So do you know what they answered? <clears throat> they answered, Mark Sivbe, what's written in it? So Hashem says, it says, Lay sir tzach, do not murder. They said, no, thank you. Hashem then went to the nation of Yishmael and said, do you want the Torah? And they said, Maksiv, pay what's written in it. Hashem said, Lay sigma, do not steal. And they said, no, thank you. Hashem then went to the nation of Moab, went to the Moabites, where Ruth actually comes from. And said, do you want the Torah? And they said, what's in it? And Hashem said, Lay Tinoff, don't commit adultery. And they said, no, thank you. And finally, Hashem came to the Jewish people and said, do you want the Torah? And we said, how much does it cost? And Hashem said, it's free. So we said, let's take two. Right? But that's what we did. We didn't really say that. But what we did say was the first time ever, the first time ever that actually we didn't ask to read the contract. First time ever that we just said, Nase ben Ishma. It's very important, these two words. It's going to be the theme of tonight. Nase means we will do. Vinishma, and then we'll understand it. Nase, we're going to do. Vinishma, and then we'll understand it. We said to Hashem, when Hashem said, You want the Torah? Fisho, Bechlet, Yala, we're there. What a, you say, John, we say, How high? We didn't ask, which is, by the way, crazy, because let's be honest, Jewish people, a little bit cynical. Let's just say we never sign contracts. And even we get a contract, normally someone asks you to sign a contract. What do you do? You like find your uncle who's a lawyer and you ask him to see it. And then he reads through it. And then he's like, mm. and then you're like, no way, forget about it. And, and yet when Hashem said, I've got a contract, which is going to define your whole life and give you full of responsibilities and kind of sell your life away. We said, sure, where do I sign? Nasa Vinishma. And we said that. So now the elders of Athens came to Rabbi Yeshua and they said, so you see really God's chosen people, actually the Christians, the Romans. That's where some of that comes from, from that Medrash. 
So Rabbi Yeshua says, mm -mm. when you put a nail in a wall, first of all, you find a place which is hollow and only then do you secure the, the nail. You remember you have the hammered nail on the wall and you're trying to like work out where it fits, where's it going to go? And only when you find a place which is hollow, then it fits. Meaning Rabbi Yeshua says, it wasn't genuine proposals to the other nations. It was more showing them that they're not cut out for it and showing us that we are cut out for it. Again, to be very clear, Hashem loves all mankind. All the nations of the world has a role to do called the Sheva Mitzvahs B'nai Noach, the seven Noachai laws. That's what Hashem wants from every single person in the world who is not Jewish. The Jewish people, what's chosen about us, we're not better or worse, or we, we just got a unique job called the Tariag Mitzvahs we're chosen to keep, the 613 Mitzvahs. That's what Hashem wants from us. Tariag Mitzvahs, 613, 613, which is, by the way, why Ruth is called Ruth. According to mysticism, Ruth is numerical value. Ruth, anyone want to type in what the numerical value of Ruth is? Resh, 200. Vov, 6. Tov, 400. 606. 606. Why? Because she had seven mitzvahs and she said, that's not enough. Mm -mm. Seven's not enough. It's funny when I have an opportunity to chat with some of my students who are going through conversion, I ask them, why would you want to become Jewish? Like, really? Can't you see the rockets? Holocaust? Like, hello? Are you joking? And, 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 the, and you can keep the seven Noah high laws and they send, sometimes it's just not enough. I need more. I just feel that I need to do more Shabbos as well. And kosher too, and Shavuot too, and, and all of them. And I have such admiration and respect and inspiration for, from those who are doing it beautifully. Which is again why we read Rus, I, honestly, which is why we read Rus on, on, on Shavuos. So with that said and done, that we said Nasa Venishma, which is by the way, going to be key, because basically when Hashem is going to say to you, and you should say this in your prayers, okay, so write this down, write this down. That when you, before Shavuot comes in, you should, as soon as Shavuot comes in, you say Ma'ariv, you say the evening prayer, and at the end of the Amidah, you should have a conversation with Hashem, and you should say to Hashem, Hashem, Na Seven Ishma, I'll do whatever you want, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in. And by the way, what the beauty of Na Seven Ishma is, intuitively, normally it's not Nishma Venas, and normally, intuitively, you say, well, I will let me work it out. Let me process. Everyone loves the word process, right? Let me process it. And then once I've processed it, that which I understand, I'll do. We didn't say that to Hashem. We said, Hashem, you're God. You're infinite. You're the creator of the world. You know, you know everything. You know the whole picture. This world. So whatever you want, Hashem, whatever you want, I'm in. And, and, and that will come. My understanding will come later. I've got a, I've got a student I'm, you know, had a, really privilege now of being a friend of his. It happened about 20 years ago. He came to my garden in my initial house called Albert Road and sat in the back garden. He said he came from a very orthodox family, but he felt all the religion was kind of rammed down his throat and he wasn't up for it. He didn't understand it. It didn't make sense to it. And it's funny, normally I, I start going through a lot of the rationale and, and the explanation. I just felt for him I said to him, you know what? And I never did this before. I said, you know what? Just start putting on tefillin. Just start with tefillin. Now I finish, but just stop doing. Stop putting on tefillin. And then come back to me with, and then we'll start looking at some of the answers. But first of all, start doing, jumping, jumping. Do like Nachshon Ben Aminodov, jumping. He was the guy who jumped into the, to the Red Sea when Hashem said, who's going to jump in? Head of the tribe of Judah, Nachshon jumped in. So I said to him, jump in, just stop putting on tefillin. And I never saw him again. So I thought, uh-oh. I really messed that up. That wasn't obviously a very good piece of advice. Quite a few years later, I saw him in synagogue during the week. Like, not even just Shabbat, but during the week. Like, who goes to synagogue during the week unless you're hardcore? And, and I'm like, hey, how are you? Long time no see. And he goes, wow, I never got a chance to thank you. You know when you told me to put on that tefillin? I kind of never stopped. And many of my questions went away. And actually, now I'm the chairman of the synagogue. And it was so beautiful to, to see that that process work that he just started doing mitzvahs and many many answers started coming to him and, and it's like you can't explain someone it's like to swim until you're swimming so we said to Hashem Nasa Venishma so we need to be able to say I'm in and my level of understanding and observance will grow slowly one step at a time but but generally I'm in Hashem I'm in I'm going to do better at being 
a, a, a better spouse to you, Hashem, because that's what it is. It's going to be a marriage on Shavuot. We're getting married. You're getting married, everybody. Mazel tov. You're getting married. So question number one is the following. With that said and done, the fact that we said, Hashem Amin Nase Venishma, how do we understand the piece of Talmud? Which is found, if you want to check it out later. And it's really important. I think it's really important to always know the sources. And especially for those who are looking to, to learn something on Shavuot night, I really recommend, listen to this, I recommend that you should read the Talmud Tractate Shabbat, page 87 to 89 which is the two pages all about Shavuot in the Talmud. Amazing stories, super deep, super inspirational. I recommend like you, it's a great thing to study through the night if you're going to be doing the Tikkun Leil, because by the way, the real work to do on Shavuot is that night, Sunday night, to try and stay up all night if you can and learn Torah and have cheesecake. We have cheesecake because, anyone know why we have cheesecake? We have milky more food on, on Shavuot night because when Hashem taught the Jewish people all the laws of Kashrut, the Ten Commandments and the other 603 and taught them about the laws of Shechita and the laws of meat and milk, the first meal practically, pragmatically we ate after the Ten Commandments was a milky meal. And that's one reason why we have more milk on Shavuot. The second reason is the sweetness of Torah, the mystics say, because it's so sweet. We try and have more sweet things on Shavuot. So try and find your best cheesecake everybody and, and enjoy and enjoy the cheesecake but more important try and stay up why because unbelievably we overslept so the Ten Commandments was at sunrise and Hashem quickly had to tell Moshe Rabbeinu to go and wake up the camp to, to go and wake everybody up so we all had to go and, and Moshe Rabbeinu woke everybody up woke everybody up so because we overslept when we got the Torah, it's tikkun leil. Tikkun means letaken, to fix the fact that we overslept. We're fixing the fact that we overslept. So it's the tractate, Mashiach now 2020, Shabbat. Tractate Shabbat, page 87 to 89. And what I'm going to now quote for you is from page 88. Pach, Pechet. And it goes like this. Says the Talmud. There's a verse in, in Exodus which says, that we stood underneath the mountain. It doesn't say in the Bible that we stood at the bottom of the mountain. It says we stood underneath the mountain. How do you stand underneath the mountain and stay alive? What on earth does that mean to, 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 to be underneath the mountain? It says the Gemara, Hashem took Mount Sinai and hovered it over our heads like a barrel and said, would you like the Torah? And we said, We'd already said, Nasa Venishma, sure. Hashem said, And by the way, if you say no, I'm going to drop it and shom to hey, Kvuraskan. There will be your burial place. There will be your burial place. Essentially, Hashem threatened us and coerced us. And put a gun to her head, metaphorically, and said, and by the way, if you say no, that will be your last word you ever say. That's not that romantic. Boys, please don't do that at home when you're trying to propose to your potential soulmate. You know, don't get out the gun and say, by the way, if you say no, that will be the last word you say. But yet, why did Hashem say that to us? And moreover, this is my question, question number one. Why does Hashem need to say it? We already said yes. Not only that, we said, Nasa Ishma. We said we're just going to do it and then we'll obey. Tosfus explains, and if you're going to do the Talmud properly, you'll see the Tosfus, the top of Tosfus, one of the, the commentators, one of the Rashi's grandchildren, writes, because when we see the great fire, we're going to be afraid. There was great fire that came out, the Gevura, there's the, the spiritual fierceness of also what had the... the awareness of spirituality that we all got at Sinai was going to be so, so intense that Hashem was worried we were going to back out and run away. But I would like to elaborate a little bit more on that and, and give you a really beautiful explanation of what that means coming up, which again, by the way, we're seeing that picture of, of the fire on Har Habayis, the fire above the Western Wall on the Temple Mount. Slumming is going on in the spiritual world because that's not normal. Mm -mm. on Yom Yom Shalayim as well, like Hashem is sending us messaging and we need to really pray and ask Hashem 
what what the message is. Anyway, so there's this fear of the great fire. Tosfa says, and Hashem was worried we were going to run away, so therefore he had to he had to threaten us to say, by the way, you have no choice about the matter. Okay, we need to understand that. That's question number one, everybody. You can make a note of that. Question number one is, why did Hashem threaten us? And by the way, the Talmud comes and says, a good question, the Talmud says, thank you, Katie, for agreeing with my question. Awesome. Now I'm, I can move on, because Katie agrees. So, the Talmud actually says, from here you can say that when we get to the next world, we could actually have an argument to Hashem and say, Hashem, it's not a legally binding contract because you coerced us. If you coerce someone into a contract, right, you try and make someone sign and you put a gun to their head, then, then it's not going to be a legal contract. So the Talmud says, so we can see it's not a legal contract. Answers the Talmud, no, so actually that's why we needed Purim, because on the Purim story, we re-accepted the Torah, but this time out of love. There was so much love going down in the Purim story that we actually said, Hashem, now forget about the threats. Now I'm re-accepting the Torah. I'm kind of renewing my marriage vows. And now I want to marry you without the threat. But then there's a problem. What about that time from Sinai till Purim and, and it needs a lot of explanation. It needs explanation, which please God, I'm going to give you if you don't go anywhere. So don't go anywhere because the best part is yet to come. So stay, stay with us. Question number two. Then the Talmud goes and says the following. Moshe Rabbeinu went up. He went up to get the Torah after Sinai. Which by the way, this was when actually we all heard, all of us, and we can hear it this year again, when we're hearing the Ten Commandments, the first two, Hashem speaks to the whole Jewish people. So at Sinai itself, Hashem didn't give prophecy to Moshe Rabbeinu, he gave prophecy to everybody, which is by the way, the reason we overslept, because we felt that we were going to get the prophecy while we were sleeping. Most prophets receive prophecy whilst you're sleeping. And that we were convinced that's how we were going to receive the prophecy. And then, mm mm-mm. And Moshe says, actually, no, you're going to be awake and receive the prophecy like I am. And by the end of the second commandment, we were like, this is too intense an experience, Hashem. Like, we get it. We know you're, we've agreed already. Can Moshe just take over now and, and let him be the one to download that level of prophecy? We can't do it anymore. Anyway. So then after the Ten Commandments, Moshe said, okay, now I've got to write it all up. And Hashem wants to give me the whole Torah itself. So I'll see you in 40 days time. And he went up and he went to the top of the mountain and he lay down and he had an out of body experience and the Shama now soars up to the Gan Eden. And when it soared up to the Garden of Eden, amazing piece of Talmud. Um, if you look at Talmud, page now 88b, it says the angels started getting angry. The angel said, we're not allowed human beings here. Mm-mm, this is like souls only. And Hashem says, no, because we're about to give him and, and his crew, the humans, the Torah, and the angels start attacking Moshe. And the angels said, no way, Hashem, how can you give these human beings, these animalistic, egotistical, vain, arrogant, material humans, the most beautiful, precious, coveted treasure. Hashem, how can you do that? So Hashem said, Moshe Rabbeinu, you answer them. And it says, Moshe Rabbeinu was very afraid. He was petrified. And it's interesting about the fire. He said he was worried that they were going to burn him with their fire, whatever that means. So then the Talmud writes, Hashem says, Moshe echoz bekisei Hold on to my chariot. Hold on to my throne. So Moshe hold on to his throne and then started giving an answer. And Moshe Rabbeinu said to the angels, angels, my dear friends, angels, what's the first of the Ten Commandments? Quiz time. Anyone, what's the first of the Ten Commandments? I am Hashem, your God, who took you out of Egypt. He turned to the angels. Angels, have you ever been to Egypt? Do you ever want to go to Egypt? It's obviously not for you. The Torah is not for angels. It's for us. We guys have been in Egypt. The Torah is tailor-made for humans. It's tailor-made for the Jewish people. The 613s is, mitzvahs is for Bnei Israel, not for Malachim. And then he gets on a roll and says, and you know, mitzvah number five, honor your father and your mother. My dear friends, angels, do you have a dad? Do you have a mom? Mm-mm. The Torah is blatantly not for you, it's for us. And then, amazingly, what then happens? What happens? 
Listen to this. What happens? The angels then turn it and say, wow, you're right, Moshe. Amazing. We love you. You're the best. We want to be friends. And they left him giving him gifts. What was the turnaround? Because I have to tell you, the angels knew about those verses. They knew it says, I am Hashem, you've got to take you out of Egypt. They know about the verse that says, honor your parents. So what chiddush, what novelty are the angels hearing, which then makes it a turnaround? Why is it that all of a sudden Moshe can convince them? What's really going on in that story? Question two. Question three. The Talmud is actually from a Medrash goes on to say, this is now a Midrash in Shemus Rabba. He goes on to say, any of you seen Mission Impossible and the whole Tom Cruise mask thing where everyone's wearing different masks? So it wasn't Tom Cruise who came up with that. It was actually Hashem. It was actually a Midrash because the Midrash says when the angel said to Hashem, what's going on with giving the Torah to Moshe? It says Hashem took off the mask of Moshe. And do you know who was hiding under the mask? It wasn't Tom Cruise. Mm-mm. Do you know who it was? It was, can you guess? Write it down if you know who was really behind Moshe Rabbeinu. Who was the person that Hashem revealed? Any guesses? Any guesses? Think about it. Who's like the beginning? Where did it all begin? Where did Judaism really begin? Avram Avinu, Abraham. And it turned out to be Abraham. It says it was Avram. So hiding behind Moses' face was Abraham. And they saw Abraham and said, whoa, Abraham, Avram Avinu. Sure. We get it. So question number three. Question number three was, what's the whole shtick? about Hashem revealing that Moshe is really Abraham and then and then everything uh, makes sense. That was question number three. Everyone back on Facebook? Are we good? Give me a thumbs up if you can hear me on Facebook. It was me. It was my fault. My internet went a bit mad. So yeah, so what does it mean that Moshe revealed Abraham behind the mask? That's question number three. And finally, question number four. Question number four is, question number four is the following. Question number four is there's, there was a mitzvah we had to do at Sinai. There was a mitzvah. Do you know what the mitzvah was? Do you know? Do you know what the mitzvah was? There was a mitzvah we did at Sinai. And that mitzvah was, it says, don't touch the mountain. Don't touch the mountain. You know that? We weren't allowed to touch Mount Sinai. Now, why was that? Why was it that we couldn't touch Mount Sinai? What's that about? What's so wrong about touching Mount Sinai? In fact, one of the names of Shavuot is based on that mitzvah, which is called Atzeres, which means to stop, stop, and don't touch Mount Sinai. So that's question number four. Why couldn't we touch Mount Sinai? What's so terrible? that We had to put fences around Mount Sinai. It wasn't like a nuclear plant. You know, we weren't going to get ill. Why couldn't we touch Har Sinai? That's my four questions. So the answers, I think, can all be found when we understand a very important principle, my friends, about love. Let's just talk about love for a minute. It's surely your favourite topic. You love talking about love. So let's talk about love for a minute. Sometimes I think Hashem has got the biggest sense of humour because he asks kind of soulmates to be together forever, but yet makes them so radically different. Male and female couldn't be more different if they tried. Couldn't be more different. Really cool book. I'm sure you've read it. Men are from Mars. Women from Venus. So different. Opposites. Why are differently? Even when we speak, it has different connotations. Le Dugma, for example. I had a case a while ago where one of my students said, Robert Hill, we need your help. I said, sure. What happens? They came round to my house. And he said... Rabbi, this is what happened. I came home one day from work and I found all my shirts at the bottom of the stairs. All my shirts at the bottom of the stairs. And I said, like, oh, what happened? He goes, my wife had chucked all my shirts down, thrown all night the carpet and screaming at me, saying, I'm never, ever, ever going to iron another shirt for you ever again. So I said, and then what happened? He goes, well, then what happened? picked them all up, put them in a black sack, took them to the dry cleaner, brought them home, started hanging them up in the cupboard again. And she gets even more angry with me. And she said, didn't you hear a word I said? And I said, oh yeah, yeah. How long have you been married? Better met, really? I said, don't you get it when a woman speaks? They are so much more spiritual than men. They are so much deeper. 
That's why they say the blessing in the morning, you've created me with your will. They're much more aligned to Hashem's will. So when they're speaking, there's a lot of stuff going on behind. There's reasons why they say what they say. Don't, when a man listens to a woman speak, he shouldn't just be listening to the words. He needs to be listening to what's behind the words. What she really, what's the messaging behind the words? And the message behind the words, when the, his wife said, I never want to iron another shirt. If he wasn't, I never want to iron a shirt. It was just say thank you. Just show me appreciation. Just don't take me for granted. So when you did and did the very wrong thing, which was go and just listen to the words itself and then go to the dry cleaner and not hear a thing, then she said, didn't you even hear me? Because it's not about the words, because we are so, so different. We are radically different. We're innately different. We're born different. But it's not just in that area. It's in so many areas. When a guy comes back from work, when a guy comes... Brian's in the house. What's up? Hashem shall make you safe and all your friends. When a guy comes back from work, what does the guy want to do? What do you want to do, guys? You just want to go and put your feet up and get your beer out or a glass of wine and chill out and what the book calls go in your cave. And yet, what does your other half want? Hasn't seen you all day to chat. It's amazing. You could, a woman could be so, so busy, but the way she's going to unwind is to chat is to like talk. So Hashem says, now I'm going to put you both together for the rest of your life and you've both got to make each other happy forever. How do you do that? That's what I say to the guys. By the way, I say to the guys, when you come home, don't think you're coming home yet. Mm -mm. Because by the way, this word compromise, I'm not into compromise. Compromise, no one's happy. What I say is, when you come home, you haven't come home yet. You've got one more meeting with the most beautiful woman in the world, apart from my wife, because my wife's that, but second which will be your spouse and and you say the first hour when i come home i'm going to be sitting together and we're going to be chatting having a meal together and then go in your cave afterwards that's kind of what it will kind of my my shtick anyway meaning a guy's got to treat his wife like a queen and the woman's got to treat his wife like a king and then everyone's happy then everyone's happy. I'll tell you a story that happened to me, my friends. When my wife turned 40, she said to me, before then, she said to me, darling, I said, like, what do you want for your present this year, darling? That's what we do. Kind of boring, sorry. And she said, this year, this year, ring. I'd love an engagement ring. It's time for an engagement ring. And I'm super confused because like we got engaged way back when we were 21 and she's got a lovely engagement ring and like, hello, it's your birthday, not your engagement. What's the whole birthday ring? But then I hopped. She meant it. She was super serious about the engagement ring and it's like, okay. But then I have to let you into a little secret. When I just got married, so then in, in her birthdays, I used to make the rookie mistake of wanting to be romantic and spontane, as they say in Israel, right? To be very spontaneous and to go and buy us a nice jewelry. So I used to go to the shop, buy us a nice jewelry, bring it home. And then my wife would take it, have a look. She's Taurus, by the way, Gavura, very honest, very straight. She'd say, really nice, really nice, darling. Thank you so much, really, thank you so much. Have you got the receipt? Do you have the receipt? It was all about the receipt. The best present was the receipt. So she could take it back and then get something that she naturally really liked. Her taste, not my taste. It's about her taste. And I tried it a few times. I could always getting it wrong. In the end, I was like, okay, darling, here's my credit card. Let me know what you get. So when she said she wants a nice, beautiful engagement ring, I was like, when I realized she was serious, there was no even like negotiation. I was like, okay, so um, here's my credit card. And she's like, no, 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 not this time. You don't get away so easy this time. Forget about that. This time, you're going to buy it. And I'm like, oh, been there, done that, get it wrong. You're going to want the receipt and then I have to go back. Really? And she's like, no, 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 obviously you're not going to buy it. I'm going to buy it. So I said, okay, so, but you're going to buy it. I'm going to, and I'm going so confused. Who's going to buy it? You, me, me, you. I know we're meant to be soulmates, but I got so confused. It says we're boss or effort with your soulmates. You're one, but like. I was getting, and I thought I'd like hopped women. And I, <sighs> so do you know what she said? She said, no, 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 no. This is what we're going to do. You, Avi Hill, are going to go on a crash course of learning all about diamonds and rings with me. 
And then I'm going to buy it. <laughs> but it's going to be as if you bought it. So you're going to buy it. And I'm and I said, ah, because you know what a woman wants more than anything? Probably what a man wants too. Is real love. Real love is when you both let go of your egos. And you both let go of your male stroke female identity and fuse into the other. Real love is unconditional. Real love is getting into each other's heads, is telepathically knowing what each other feels before they say they feel it. That's what Hashem wants from us. He wants from us to erode our egos, to get to such a level of what's called his spotless, surrendering our material desires that you can then fuse with the other and you truly become a boss or echot, a one. That's what love really is. The numerical value for Ahava, Aleph, one, hey, five, bet, two, hey, five, comes to 13. It's the same numerical value as Echad, which is one, Aleph, Chet, Dul, Tal, it's also 13. Because love and oneness is the same. And therefore, my dear friends, this is what Hashem is going to want from us this Shavuos. That's why we have this phrase in the Torah, Derech, the Pirkei Avot, Derech Eretz Kadma La Torah, which means, first of all, be a vessel for love, be someone who's kind, have good midot, be a mensch, be someone who's not egotistical, vain or arrogant, be someone who's open for love and open for giving, and then you're ready for Torah, and then you're Derech Eretz Kadma La Torah. That's why Hashem makes Abraham first. First of all, there's Abraham. He's preparing the way. He's making ourselves a vessel. Everything's a vessel and light. But for the vessel and light, we need to be a vessel to receive that light. To make yourself a vessel, a lot of spiritual work needs to go behind the scenes to become one with Hashem. You know, one of my uh, friends in Israel, a rabbi called Rabbi David Ahrens, when he started teaching mysticism, wanted to go into what Kabbalah was. He tells me a story that he went to get trained up and he was told to go to this tish, this big Hasidish Friday night, spiritual rave, what I call it. And there's thousands of, of Hasidim on the stands and then there's the rabbi there, there's the rabbi there and the Rebbe calls over this Rabbi David Ahrens in front of everybody. And David Ahrens is a little bit shy and a little bit embarrassed and he has an apple, we'll use the pen, and he says, is rabbi, take the apple. So Rabbi Aaron's went and tried to grab the apple and the rabbi moved it away. So he said, no, no, try and take the apple again. And he took it away again in front of everyone. Rabbi Aaron's is getting more and more embarrassed. And then he said, okay, now just put your hand and receive the apple. And then he went like that and put the apple in him. He said, that's Kabbalah, that's receiving. Too many times in life and in love, we try and put our own opinions in, our own bias, and then we're not a vessel which is open for love. So for example, even a couple of days ago, me and my wife had a bit of a seeing a creative discussion where we're seeing the world from very different places. And I really tried to say, you know, what, even though I really, me, Avi Hill, my kind of identity, my nature and nurture and soul doesn't get what you're saying, the fact that you're saying it and you're my soulmate means it must be true let's just enter into your world and then by entering into my wife's world I was able to get it I was able to get it but I had to kind of shed my material ego behind and then allow my soul almost to dive in to my wife's and then we were a one with her position and I think sometimes when you're having arguments with people I really recommend that just try and really figure out what they're coming from Forget about your position for a while. Just go into that world. And by the way, some of you are going to say this phrase that many of you in Tel Aviv told me, Altier Freya, which means like, don't be a doormat. Don't be uh, pathetic. You know, don't be weak. God forbid. That's such a Yitzhahara expression, a satanic expression. Obviously, in a scenario where, God forbid, there's abuse in the relationship, then you're not meant to obviously take the abuse. If it's, you know, serious, um, sinful, illegal stuff going on, then... You've got to keep away from that. But 
If it's just you're coming from different places, you're seeing it in different places, then try and just go into the other person's place and heart and soul and mind and, and put down your armor, put down your bias, put down your narrative and enter the other person's narrative. And before you know it, there's no disagreement anymore. And real marriage, by the way, is going into both of each other's narratives. So, for example, you know, maybe some of you have this issue where the guy wants to go to a meaty restaurant and the girl wants to go to a milky restaurant. So when we want to go out for a meal, like, what are we going to do? So the beginning of our marriage, I was like kind of to pull to the meat. My wife was putting to the milk. But then we got to a really beautiful place where I actually wanted to do what my wife wanted and she wanted to do what I wanted. And then we were still confused. So now we kind of have this beautiful thing. If it's the daytime, it's milk. We both know that. And if it's the night time, it's meat, unless it's my wife's birthday, right? But my point is, that's what you're meant to do. You're meant to, it's not about compromise, it's about love. The, the root of the word love, ahava, is have, is giving. The more you give and, and, and really giving and put down your own bias and your own ego, that's when you're gonna feel beautiful love and, and, and oneness and unity. And it's not just the secret. Of relationships is the secret of the ultimate relationship, which is between you and Hashem. Because my dear friends, that's what Shavuot is. Shavuot is not 613 rituals that now I have to learn to do. God forbid. No wonder, if people think that's what it is, no wonder, no one's up for it. It's 613 languages of love. It's 613 expressions of love between us and Hashem. The word mitzvah comes from the word, there's the Balatani called safsa the chibur, interconnecting, woven, like fabric weaving into each other. It's our way of connecting to Hashem. It's kind of Hashem's email address that we can message Hashem and become united with Hashem. But what we need to do is say Nasa Venishma, which is kind of put our ego aside and say, even though I don't get it, Hashem, but you get it. And that's good enough for me. It's what I often say to my, my wife. I can assure you this stuff even now. I'm getting close to, please God, 30 years of marriage. I still don't understand a lot of the time where and, uh, she's coming from because we're different. But nonetheless, that, she's saying it, the queen's saying it. You got to do, you got to do what she says. So now let's answer the questions. Question number one was, why did Hashem hover the mountain over our heads? We said, what did we say? We'd already said, Nasa Venishma. We said to Hashem, we'll do whatever you say. So why is he threatening us with putting the mountain over our head? Because what Hashem is telling us, what Hashem is telling us, if by you saying Nasa Venishma, you still might think you're in control. You still might think it's your ego and your bias and your narrative and your choice and your instinct choosing it, but what happens when you're not feeling it? What happens when you have a bad day? What happens when there's an Iran episode? What happens when there's rockets flying? You might say, whoa, I'm out of this. So Hashem puts the mountain over our head to show us. He can't live without us too. He can't live without us. You know, my mom and my dad, one of the beauties of having a great marriage is you feel at one and you become interconnected to each other. The sad part is one of you passes away then the other person feels they're like an empty shell. They've got like a lost limb and they can't move forward. And my mom definitely has been feeling that this year. And Hashem was kind of showing the whole Jewish people that, that when it says Hashem created the world, Barashas Baral Akimi created the world to have a relationship with the Jewish people. And if we say no, there's no point in even creating the world. Hashem would have to like start all over again because we are his soulmate. We are the soulmates of Hashem. Hashem can't live without us. So it's kind of no option. It's like you fall in love so much where you don't even need to propose. You just know. Funny enough, when me and my wife, there was this point where we hit in our dating where we just both just knew we were going to marry each other. We didn't even say the words. I kind of said it because you have to say it. But we just knew. You got to that innate like clarity of like, wow, we're going to marry each other. And, and Hashem obviously always had that. And that's why he was maintaining to us that Guys, don't think that we're getting married just because you're saying yes. We're getting married because we're getting married because we are soulmates. We're born for each other. We are each other's other half. Which is, by the way, we're sure we're saying to the elders of Athens, we fit. The nail can go in the wall. Why? Mostly because there are Heretz called Malatara. Mostly because we've come from Abram Ravinu. We come from a place that we've surrendered our ego. We've displayed love and kindness tremendously through the years. 
Our whole journey from Abraham through 500 years later to Moses was a journey of erosion of the ego and erosion of, gi- of giving and surrendering and giving and giving and giving. And now we're ready to receive Hashem's light. Because we can make that step called his spotless, totally giving up and sacrificing for Hashem. And that's why Hashem hovered the mountain over our heads. Because Torah is not optional. Without it, we can't breathe. Says the Maharal of Prague, just like oxygen, it's not a free will choice to breathe. If you want to live, you breathe. For the Jewish people, if we're going to continue in this world and continue up to Mashiach, it's with the Torah. It's our life force. It's our oxygen. It's what's our bloodline. It's what keeps us alive. And Hashem was trying to show it's not just an optional, like a buffet. Oh, have a bit of sushi. Do you want it or not? God forbid. You want, that, it's part of living. And then we asked question number two, which was, anyone remember question number two? How do we understand the whole angels saying to Moses, you don't deserve her? And then he, he explains it to them and then they're okay. Because really what's going on, Hashem says the Hasim Sofa, when Hashem said, Moshe Rabbeinu, hold on to my throne. That was the answer. When they realized that we can become one with Hashem, when they realized us and Hashem as soulmates, when he realized we were allowed to hold on to Hashem's throne, that there's part of Hashem in us, and even with our free will, we can get to that magical place of spiritual oneness with our free will. We're way higher than angels. They straight away said, oh my gosh, you're actually greater than us. You're greater than us. But I'll tell you something amazing that the, the Midrash says, that the angel said this line, who revealed the secrets of the angels to the humans? How did Moshe Rabbeinu know this? What does it mean, the secrets of the angels? Because one of the secrets of the angels is they are mispata. Angels do whatever God wants. God says to Raphael, go and heal. He says, okay. He says to Gabriel, go and protect the land of Israel. Go and be Iron Dome. He says, okay. We have that ability too. And by with free will, choosing to be subservient, that's higher than just being naturally subservient. Because we choose to be subservient, because we have this huge ego, we have this huge narrative, we have this huge bias, and if we're prepared to surrender it, put it aside, and say, Hashem, whatever you want, Nasev and Nishma, that's way higher than what the angels can do. And that's why they went and said, okay, Moshe, I'll give you the gifts. And that's now under the answer to number three, why Abraham is the face under Moshe, because the secret behind Moshe is giving. Abraham is the one individual that actually not only gave, but actually gave to the angels himself. The famous story in Genesis when Abraham's sitting outside his tent after circumcision and, and the angels, Raphael, Gabriel, and M- 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 Michael, come in. And Abraham says, let me be kind to you. Let me feed you and give you food and drink. By the way, angels don't eat. So the whole thing was kind of a facade and yet it was the paradigm in the quintessential act of kindness because it was genuinely coming from a place of love. Abraham showed the angels that even though we're human beings, we can love selflessly. We can be selfless in our loving. We can be unconditional. It says in Pirkei Avot, I think chapter 5, number 16. I could be wrong. It says every love which lasts forever needs to be unconditional love. If it's love which has conditions, then when the condition goes, the love dies. Isn't that deep? That means if you want unconditional, if you want to have love, it's got to be unconditional love. If you want to have a relationship with Hashem, it should be unconditional. It shouldn't be, I'll give it to you as long as I'm rich. I'll give it to you as long as I'm healthy. I'll I'll, I'll be with you, Hashem, as long as we're safe. That means come rain or shine. Come peace, come war. Hashem, I'm there for you. Whether I understand it or not, I'm there for you. Same with the marriage. That's what it should be with the marriage. Shouldn't just be when things are going well, we'll stay together, but as soon as stuff gets really hard, I'm out of here. It should be we're here together forever. Obviously, there needs to be exceptions sometimes when extreme things happen, but all things being equal, often when you're having a, a marriage where there's issues, actually give more, give more. You need to be even more selfless and enter into each other's head more and stop staying in the male position, the female and the female female position. Start really entering into each other's world much more. And finally, now we understand Reb Levi Yitzchok Bedichev when he said, what's the mitzvah we had to do at Sinai? Don't touch the mountain. Because if you want to get to the Ten Commandments, don't touch the mountain. Which means show Hashem you can surrender. 
Show Hashem that you might want to be hungry, but you can back off. You first of all got to show Hashem we're mispatel, we can surrender our ego, we can have self-control. You know that time maybe when you wanted to say some lotion horror about someone, you wanted to speak bad, but then you stop yourself. That's why you're meant to think before you speak. That moment when you're thinking of getting angry and you're about to like lose it with anger and you're meant to stop first and then get angry. Meaning you're meant to stop, sorry, and then count to 10 and then hopefully the anger dissipates. That's what we had to do. We had to put our ego, put our narrative, put our bias, put our wishes aside by the mountain and say, even though we would like to go and ascend, we're going to step back. We're going to stop, surrender. That's why Shavuot is called Atzeres. It's called stopping. That's why King Solomon says, So me ra for Asetov. First of all, learn self-control and then you can do good. So self-control, and that's why in the marriage and the love, a lot of it comes from just saying, darling, what can I do? How can I make your life better today? Entering into each other's space and, and putting your own desires aside. And that's when your desires are going to be much higher met than, than ever before. So in short, my dear friends, now we understand Ruth. Ruth, why do we read the book of Ruth? Ruth famously says to her mother-in-law, she, what she says to him, wherever you go, I go. Wherever you die, I die. She's unconditional love. Ah, oh. That's the way we need to be with Hashem. That's why King Solomon writes in, in the Song of Songs that really our relationship with Hashem is the biggest love affair. But at the very beginning of Shir Hashir, Hashem says, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. Kissing and love is really alluding to us and Hashem. That's where it's meant to be. That's why the famous line in Shir Hashir, Hashem says, Ani dodi vidodi li, I if my, my beloved, and my beloved is for me. Do we have unconditional love with each other, with ourselves and with Hashem? If we can do that magic, Hero, that's Shavuot. That's what we need to achieve. So in short, my dear friends, wishing you all a hug Sameach. We can now, thanks to Boris, we're allowed to hug, so we can have a true hug Sameach. I'm wishing you all a beautiful Yom Tov. So what you need to do is between now and Shavuot, do on one hand acts of giving, another hand acts of self-control. For the men, try and go to the mikveh. I recommend that. We went to the mikveh before we got the Torah. We had to cleanse ourselves and get ready to be a vessel to receive that light when Shavuot comes in. I should have said maybe before Shavuot, I would recommend obviously getting, getting your house ready. So it's like a Shabbat. So there should be a hot urn. There should be a Shabbos plate. So we don't, you know, we're able to have the food in, in, in the correct way, try and take off work. And have for those in Israel, just one day for those outside Israel, two days of spiritual bliss. And, and on that evening on Sunday night, you say to Hashem, Na'ase v'nishma. And then in the morning, and even if you don't go to synagogue, at least open up the Ten Commandments and read through the Ten Commandments because it's actually going to come to us. There's going to be a download of the Ten Commandments plus the other 603. Hashem's going to give you the Torah. Hashem's going to marry you. And then, please God, you need to say Na'ase v'nishma because unlike Pesach, where the energy comes to you and you have a higher level of consciousness whether you like it or not, Shavuos, that's why most people don't access it, it depends on you. You've got to choose if you want it through hard work, through spiritual endeavor, through erosion of the ego to say, Hashem, I'm there for you. I want it. And please God, all of us will say, Nasa Nishma. Hashem should have tremendous protection in the land of Israel. Enough already, Hashem. There should just be shalom. There should be genuine peace, genuine completion. Mashiach should come. There should, God forbid, never be a fire on the Temple Mount ever again. There should be a beautiful new third base on Mikdash, which should bring total peace to the whole of humanity. Total oneness, where the whole world will say, that one day everybody's going to say, Hashem Echod Ushmai Echod. And we spoke about Echod, the magic of Echod is number 13, which is the same numerical value as love. So please God, we're all going to achieve that love we have for ourselves, we have for others and we have for Hashem. Hashem should give us tremendous protection and please God, we're going to be celebrating Shavuot together this year in the rebuilt and very, very safe Jerusalem.